Welcome to night number three of Prophecies for Today. Before we get started, I, I want to show you a little news article that some of our guests handed me this evening. This is from the NBC, NBC TopInfoPost.com. talks about NBC News. It says, all Americans will be microchipped by the year 2017. This is the first I saw this, so I'm going to have to check it out. How far away is 2017? Sounds far away, but it's really only <laughs> three years away. And it, the technology exists now to do that. So I want to thank you, ladies. I'll look into this for sure. Before we start, I'd like to ask you, turn those cell phones off. I better turn mine off. Did you bring your Bibles? We want you to we want you to see what we're studying from your own Bible. And take I want to encourage you again to take notes. I'll be <coughs> excuse me, I'll be moving fairly quickly so we can get everything in. Uh oh, technical difficulty. Again, we'll have handouts at the at the end of the presentation. Be sure there's two handouts tonight. Be sure to pick both of them up. And we'll be reading tonight from the only chapter in the Bible that was written by a pagan king. And we've been studying in the book of Daniel, and tonight we're going to look at Daniel chapter 4, which was written by King Nebuchadnezzar. And he's telling us in this chapter how he was converted to be a follower of the one true God. And he came out from paganism, out of the sun worship that was rampant in the Babylonian kingdom, in his kingdom, to worship the one true creator God. But before we start, let's begin with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we open your word this evening, that you would send your Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us into your truth and give us clearness of mind and understanding. And we ask that you would send your angels to put a hedge about us so that there's no distraction, so that we can concentrate on your message to us this evening. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start right off in Daniel chapter 4. If you have your Bible, we'll start in verse 1. And Nebuchadnezzar the kings, unto all the people, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Nebuchadnezzar is telling us he's found the secret of peace when he says, peace be multiplied unto you. And that he's going to show us how that peace is found in God and not in the things of the world. Verse 2. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. So he's acknowledging that God has done many wonderful things in his life. Verse 3, How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. That sounds a lot different than we heard from him in the last chapter when he was going to throw people in the furnace because they didn't want to worship his image. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar was the wealthiest and most powerful king in the world at this time. Nebuchadnezzar in verse 4 says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. He had a couple of palaces. 
and probably like nothing any of us have ever seen. He was very rich. He was flourishing or prospering. He was the king of the most powerful empire on the earth, and he had everything the world could offer, but he still didn't have eternal life, and he didn't have peace with the God of heaven. But then God spoke to him in another dream, which we're going to read about in a minute, to try to focus his attention on eternal things and not the passing pleasures of this world. Let's read the story as it starts in verse 5. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. So he had another dream, and this one troubled him also. The one in chapter 2 was troubling to him. Remember, he, he couldn't remember it, but it was, was upsetting to him. And again, he consults the Babylonian wise men. And these are the same ones that had already failed him at least twice. So I wonder if Nebuchadnezzar was a little bit of a slow learner. Three, that old saying, three strikes and you're out. This is their third time. I wonder how many times these wise men and worldly counselors, counselors had failed him in the past before we started learning of him. Verse 7. Then came in the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying... O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret trouble with thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. So this is quite a compliment the king is making to Daniel and to God. First he calls him the master of the magicians. And Daniel had really earned that title, but it wasn't Daniel who was it. It was God that had put him in that position and given him the, the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to interpret dreams. Why didn't the king call Daniel in from the start when he knew Daniel could interpret dreams? Could it be that he feared what the interpretation might be? Because this is another troubling dream. The last troubling dream he had, he didn't like that one. So I wonder if he just, he wanted to know but he didn't want to know. And if he, he didn't have any choice. He had to ask Daniel, consult Daniel to find out what the dream, dreams were. Are we like that sometimes? We are. I, know, I am. Nobody really wants to hear bad news. People avoid God's truth because we're going to afraid, we're, we're afraid it may be going to convict us to do something about it. And did you know that that's what the devil exactly wants to, what the devil wants us to think? He wants us to be afraid of God's truth. However, God's word and the truths contained in it, along with the gift of eternal life, will never, ever harm us. They're given to save us and improve our lives. In John chapter 8, verse 32, I don't have a slide for this. It says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Free. Let's see how the king relates to what Daniel has to say. These were the kings talking to Daniel. These were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. And the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, to the end of all the earth. And the leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and it was... In it was meat for all, the beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bows thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. And I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. 
And he cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches. Shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts of the feet... Uh, let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from its branches. So the king tells Daniel of his dream that he dreamed of a giant tree that was cut down at the command of God. The Holy One from heaven gave that command. Verse 16 says, Did I skip a slide? 15. None, nevertheless, leave this stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Verse 17, And this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Verse 18, This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. So, now Daniel, he takes a minute, he, he, I believe he already knew what this verse meant, this, this dream meant. And he takes a little while before he's, he will tell the king the dream. Verse 19 tells us, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. So the, this dream is very must have been not good news. Daniel was even a little upset about it. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. So Daniel's telling him, it's not good news for the king. Even though Daniel understands it did not contain a favorable, favorable message, his duty to God and the king is to tell the king the truth anyway. So I want to pause here and ask for agreement from each of you that you want to hear God's word, what God's word has to say for us living in these last days even if it might not be what you expect it to be. Because it's not all good news. So even if something that I might say, if it goes against some teaching or belief that you have might have, do you want to know the truth? Raise your hand if you want to know the truth. Everybody in the church. Even if you didn't raise your hand, I'd still have to tell you the truth anyway. <laughs> you don't want me to smooth it over, right? Should anybody smooth over a truth of God? Sugarcoat it? Or do you agree that we should give it to you straight? Okay. Verse 20. The tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong. This is Daniel giving the interpretation of the dream. Whose height reached unto the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth. Whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much and in it was meat for all. Under the beasts in the field dwelt and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven, and thy dominion unto the end of the earth. <clears throat> so again we see that God is giving Nebuchadnezzar a dream in which he has the primary part. In Daniel chapter 2, the king was represented by what? On that great image, the king was represented by the head of gold. And here he's represented in this dream as this great tree that reached to heaven. 
verse 23 says, And whereas the king saw a watcher and a an holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. So this dream shows us that God is getting ready to execute judgment on the king because of his sins. God had tried through many different ways to get the king to repent. We know of Daniel chapter 2. He gave the king the image. In Daniel chapter 3, we read, we read about the, the image that, Daniel, that, that Nebuchadnezzar set up. And he ended up throwing God's faithful servants into the burning fiery furnace. And what happened? Nothing nothing harmed them and it was an evidence of the power and protection and the love of God for his people and still the king the king didn't get it so now the God of heaven is going to deal directly with the king of Babylon the king the king knew all this almost like in, in chapter 5 where it says the king knew all this and that he didn't repent Nebuchadnezzar knew all this. It had happened to him directly, and yet he refused to repent. So God comes to him again in this chapter in the book of Daniel and says, I'm giving you one last opportunity. I love you and I want you to be saved, but if you continue in your sins, you will be lost. Verse 24. Daniel says, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. So sentence was pronounced on the king. Daniel told him that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now Daniel begins to plead with the king. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So God hasn't executed the sentence of judgment yet. There's, this, this verse tells us there's still time for Nebuchadnezzar to repent. But this is the absolute last chance. Today, most people are not so lucky that they're told specifically, this is your last chance. So it's important to us when we, when we hear, the, hear the Spirit of God talking to us and telling us to repent, that might be that call to us. That might be our last chance. So it's important to respond positively to that. Notice how the, Daniel defines conversion here. He says it involves the breaking off of sins. Stop sinning. Sometimes sin seems hard to quit or to put away. But God will give us the power if we just ask Him to and be honest with Him and we ask Him for help to do it by exercising our faith in His grace. How are we to turn away from sin? Daniel says we should break off sin by our righteousness. Righteousness is right doing. The only way to find power to do right and stop sinning is by asking Jesus to come into our hearts and abide with us through the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. That's the only way. You can't do it by yourself. I can't do it by myself. I tried. doesn't work. Philippians chapter 1 in the New Testament, verse 11, says, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. We have to be filled with the Spirit of God. And you know the good thing is, God even gives us repentance. But that's not even of ourselves. God gives us repentance. All we have to do is exercise it. 
Unfortunately, the king delayed his decision to follow Daniel's counsel. Verse 28 says, All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Now look what he said in his pride and his self-confidence. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house, the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? You see where this is going? And while the word was yet in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. So one year later, Nebuchadnezzar still hasn't changed. And we don't know how many times God pled with him in that space of 12 months. I'm sure there was some. It had to be. Daniel was his chief counselor. D Daniel knew this was going to happen. I'll bet Daniel brought this to the king every day. I, I, don't, I wouldn't, maybe more, more than once a day. But the king hadn't made any effort to repent or to know and acknowledge the Holy One, the true Creator God of Heaven, as the ruler and Lord of his life. Why? Because his pride got in his way. Or he thought, I have enough to, uh, to, I, tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. Mostly it was his pride. Is, it, is not this a great Babylon that I built by the might of my power for the honor of my majesty? But eventually, there's a limit that God draws that men cannot cross. And God reluctantly withdrew his blessing from the king, and he loses his mind. Do you know what causes more people to be lost than anything else? It's procrastination. It's not outright rebellious disobedience. It's procrastination. Just like in the days of the flood, I'm sure a lot of those people, probably they helped build that ark. They fully intended to get on that boat. But they procrastinated until, until one day the door was shut and it was too late. They woke up and the door was shut. I'll bet you they wanted to get on the boat then. And we were told that it didn't rain for eight, seven or eight days after God shut Noah in the ark. And I'm sure that if people were convicted that they wanted to get on the boat, and nothing happened and nothing happened, that conviction probably died down in their hearts and they, go, and they started joking about it. What's it. How's it smelling in there, Noah? With all those animals locked in that boat? What happened when it started to rain? I'll bet that conviction came right back really quickly. So there's absolutely no reason to not respond to God in a positive way when he's speaking to your heart. Or to mine. I'm preaching to myself. Putting off and delaying a decision to turn from sin and turn to Jesus could have disastrous consequences. God wants to save us, but He will not force our will. We have to come to Him. This story from the Old Testament shows us that God will go to extreme lengths to try to get our attention so we're not eternally lost. He wants everyone to be saved in his kingdom. He doesn't want one single person to be lost. There's absolutely no reason. Jesus has already paid the price for our eternal salvation. I think it's time we should give him what he paid for, don't you? I, I've personally observed that when, as soon as a person begins to procrastinate, the devil traps them in disobedience or lack of care, and then one day it's too late. They think it's no longer important. I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar was deeply affected by Daniel's words. He trusted Daniel. He's the only one of his wise men he could trust. And he had every intention of following him or following Daniel's counsel. But I guess it just didn't seem to the king that he had to do it right then. He could put it off. He was a king after all. Each, each time a person resists and delays, it makes it that much harder to respond the next time. 
And contrary to that, each time a person responds positively, it makes it that much easier to respond positively the next time. Because you, you make a decision of which path to follow. But it's important to get on the path. So this was a tragic mistake for the king. The king of the most powerful kingdom on earth was out living among the beasts of the field for seven years in the fields like an animal. I wonder how soon it came to his mind to, that he realized he maybe should have listened. Probably wasn't a good experience. And fortunately for Nebuchadnezzar, it's not the end of the story because God is so merciful, we don't even understand his mercy. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 says, At the end of the days, at the end of those seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35 tells us, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? So Nebuchadnezzar finally learned the lesson that brings him to repentance and a change of heart. He was what we would call today born again. He had a personal revival and reformation in his heart because he submitted to the will of the God of the universe. When the king learned this lesson, his reasoning returned to him. Verse 36 says, And at the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. So God restored him back, and excellent majesty was given to him. It's interesting that we see again and again that when men honor the God of the universe, the God of the universe honors men. We saw it in Daniel chapter 2. We saw it in Daniel chapter 3. And here it is again. This, this was a pagan king and God honored him once he submitted his will to God. Verse 37 tells us, And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the, and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways are judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Now I know for my, for my own life, I've been distracted by events and cares of the world too long. And... Sometimes I, for, it's sad to admit it, but I've forgotten the blessings that God gives to me every day. I start taking them for granted. So I can understand a little bit how Nebuchadnezzar feels. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that we need to constantly be aware of the distractions all around us and the cares of this world because they could end up causing our eternal ruin. It's that important. Just some little distraction off in the side to prevent us from following God with all of our heart could result in our eternal loss of eternal salvation. Well, sometimes we think we can control more in our lives than we actually can. <laughs> How much are we really in control of? Not a whole lot. At least I'm not. I think I can. I, I can manipulate stuff, but... The big things, I can't control it. I mean, there's, there's law. We're, we're operating in laws that God has set up for our life. And I know that the providence of God has worked in my life. I've seen it. I've seen Him save me from car accidents. <laughs> Just, I'm driving down the road, and there, I can see this accident coming, and my car's getting out of the way. And I'm not doing it, because I'm like, oh, I can't respond fast enough. There's a very important lesson here for us that God is in control of our lives. Many people want to argue and play games with God. Some people willingly delay making decisions. Others believe their case might even be hopeless, so they think, why bother? My own brother told me that. He goes, I've done, I've done so much wrong in my life, why bother? 
Well, my answer is you still have breath in your life. That's why you can bother. Because Jesus died for you. That's why you bother. We try to, as humans, we try to second guess God, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. And we're, we're not to question God's authority or his right to do things in our lives his way. Because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's best for us, even though it might totally not seem what we want as anything that we would choose for ourselves. God knows differently. Why are we not to question God's authority? Because we are bought with a price. And we belong to Him. Whether we recognize it or not, we do. We belong to God. He's our Maker and He's our Redeemer. He paid the highest price heaven could pay in order to redeem us from our disobedience and sin. And I want to give God what He paid for. He paid for my life and He paid for yours. And I want to give it back to Him every day that He gives me breath. Now, we might not always understand it, but we are to trust that God loves us supremely and that we should always be in an attitude of obedience and repentance. We have to learn to exercise our faith and take God at His word and obey Him without second-guessing like Nebuchadnezzar did or procrastinating. Daniel chapter 2, 4, verse 37 says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the king of heaven and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Another lesson here is that pride causes many to lose eternal life. It almost cost Nebuchadnezzar. Did you know that pride and selfishness are the very seeds of sin? The Bible tells us when Lucifer rebelled in heaven, it was pride that started it. Pride says, I understand what God's telling me to do, but I don't care. I'm going to do it my way, regardless of what God says. I still have time to do what I want, and then I'll ask for forgiveness later. I, I, I'm reminded of John Wayne. John Wayne did a confession on his deathbed. He accepted God. Did you know that? <laughs> the life that John Wayne lived, on his deathbed, he repented and accepted God. That's getting in just under the wire. Don't do it. <laughs> he, was, he was very, very blessed that he was able to give him that time to do that. Nebuchadnezzar found the peace that only comes from knowing God. And we all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's a lot of truth in that verse. A lot of people know that. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a reaffirmation of the fact that God loves us so much. He gave his... He, gave, he emptied heaven. He gave everything heaven could give. There was nothing left to give. To save. You know, it's interesting that the day that I realized that Jesus would have left all eternity, he would have given up his eternity so that I could have it, that's the day I was converted. Just for me. He gave up all eternity, immortality, so I could have it. He didn't want to be there if I couldn't be there. I'd like to quickly focus on some scriptures that look, that tell us how we can have this peace in our lives. Acts chapter 11 verse 17 says, For as much then as God gave them the gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now this is the, the Apostle Paul talking that the salvation was no longer just given to the Jews. It was also given to the Gentiles. God grants us repentance. 
I mentioned that before. God gives us repentance. All we have to do is use it. When you're convicted by your conscience that you've done something wrong, and you know it's wrong, that's the Spirit of God telling you to repent and ask for forgiveness. That's the time to do it. We're to repent of and forsake our sins because they have caused, and they still do cause, God pain every time we sin. You think about that? You don't think about, people don't think about that. When they think, when they willfully sin, you're causing the God of heaven pain today if you sin. You're still causing him pain. In other places in the Bible it says repent and be baptized. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. That's a little hard to read. It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a wonderful and a very powerful promise from our Savior. If we confess, he will forgive us. I'd like to include with this text the previous verse and the next verse surrounding it in Scripture. John chapter 1 verse 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then the one we just read, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. So are we able to make God a liar? God is not a liar. He's not a man. Is there anybody that would like to call God a liar? I don't think so. These are strong words with a strong promise. The Apostle John... He writes like this. He cuts directly to the heart. We're all sinners. There's no doubt about it. And we all need to confess our, our specific sins to God each time we sin. But it's more than just confessing and sinning and confessing and sinning. We have to separate ourselves from sin through His power. Stop sinning. When we sin, when I sin, I ask God to, to make, every day I ask Him to make me hate sin. I want a hatred for sin. Not just in act, but in words and thoughts. It's all sin. Should we continue to sin? No. We should forsake that like the plague. Confess and forsake your sins. Turn away from them. And I'm asking God every day to do that for me. To give me a hatred for sin. If we ask for power in our life to not sin, do you think God would answer that prayer? He has to. He wants us to not sin. Does He? Does He want us to continue in sin? No way. Some people say, well, I can't stop sinning. It's too hard. Now, that's really just an excuse people give because I used to give it. <laughs> My answer to that now is, who's stronger, the devil or God? And where is your allegiance? If the God of heaven, is, are you, if you're asking him for power not to sin, he's going to answer that prayer. The words of Jesus in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door... I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. That's the promise. If we ask God for help and we invite him in, he will come in and give us the power to overcome sin. But you have to ask him to come into your heart through the presence of the Holy Spirit and be your savior from sin, to be your friend and the rightful ruler of your life. What's the alternative? You break the heart of God and you will die in your sins. God wants everyone to know the truth. We read that. 
He wants us to be free and to be saved. And the really most powerful thing is, it's completely in our choice because He doesn't force us. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God wants us not only to be saved from sin, but He wants us to understand the knowledge of the truth because He wants to make us free. Who doesn't want to know and follow God's truth? Somebody that doesn't want to ever have eternal life. Of course, not everyone is going to cooperate. But this is God's desire nonetheless. Let's ask Jesus, what must happen for a person to have the hope of eternal life? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Can't. That's the words of Jesus. The Spirit of God convicts or reproves us of sin. We're born again by that Spirit when we admit that the conviction is accurate and that we're sinners and we need a Savior from sin. Then we confess to God and surrender our lives in obedience and faith. The Spirit of God is, the Spirit of God is invisible to us it's like Jesus said, it was like the wind. He convicts us in our hearts where no one can see it. John chapter 8, verse 16, verse 8, it says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. He convicts us in our conscience. John chapter 8 verse 9 says, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now this is the story of the woman taken in adultery, and the, the, the men brought her to Jesus to see if they could trap Jesus more than anything. And Jesus wouldn't condemn anybody. He said, let he that's among you without sin first cast the stone. And they were, the next verse says, and when they heard it, they were convicted by their own conscience and they went out one by one. Because they all knew they were sinners, just like the woman they were accusing. Well, this is the experience of being born again by the Spirit and the result of God's, of the Spirit's work is seen in a changed life. So the fact that those men were convicted by their own conscience. That was the knock on the door for them to let Jesus in their heart so they could have been saved. That was it. And for all we know, that was the last one. We don't know really who those men were specifically, but we don't know that they ever got another chance like that again. Acts chapter 2 verse 37 now when they heard this, this is a different story. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's another promise. If you repent and be baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's a promise of God. These people were convicted and they responded correctly. They asked, what do we do? Because they didn't know. And Peter told them. The proper response of a conviction of the Spirit of God is to repent, even if you've already accepted Jesus. All right? If you've already accepted Jesus in your heart a hundred times, and you, you get a conviction in your heart, the proper response is still to repent. And for these people, it was to be baptized also. So they were born of the Spirit. They were convicted and, and they repented. And then they were born of the water. They were baptized. Notice that they didn't procrastinate like Nebuchadnezzar did. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 
Now, what we don't know is how many people heard it. <laughs> but 3,000 people responded positively for God's kingdom that day. Jesus said the Spirit is invisible like the wind. No one sees Him convicting your heart, but you know He's doing it. Conviction becomes visible when we respond by conversion and baptism. Have you ever heard the saying that when a baby's born, it's the miracle of birth? It's the same thing with this. It's a miracle of birth into the family of God. Same thing. So water baptism becomes the visible expression of what God has done in our hearts and our minds through His invisible Spirit. So, do we understand that Jesus makes it clear that to receive eternal life, we have to take a visible stand for Him? You have to. Receiving eternal life follows a simple process. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Before baptism, a person needs to be taught the Bible truth. God wants us to understand and know the truth. We read that in Philippians. The book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 16 says, And he that believes, believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So if somebody doesn't believe, they're not going to get baptized. They're, they're going to think it's foolishness. Actually, the Bible says the things of God are foolishness to the world. They can't understand them. But Jesus says we need to be baptized. Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy, the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. That's us. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So if you hear the Spirit of God calling you, don't resist it. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto him about 3,000 souls. Let's look at what this baptism represents. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 talks about baptism. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so should we walk in the newness of life. So baptism symbolizes a death to sin, a burial to, of the old life to sin, and a resurrection to walk in a new relationship with God. That's why it's under the water and back up. It symbolizes a death, a burial, and a resurrection. Those three things. It's a really, really good symbol. Actually, what happened to Jesus? Romans chapter 6, verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall, also in the likeness, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might, not, might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. But God doesn't want us to sin. He's helping. He's giving us every, every help He can. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. This is the baptism of Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus went down into the Jordan River and then he came up out of it. He had to go down into the river and there he was baptized or immersed. The word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip or immerse. 
Like when they, when they would dye a piece of cloth, you'd totally immerse it into the dye. That's what the, where the word comes from. A baptism, Bible baptism, is a beautiful experience to go down into those waters and commit your life to Jesus. It gives you the sense of personal peace and assurance. You know that you're doing the right thing and you feel the blessing of God as a result of your commitment to Christ. Have you experienced the blessing of water baptism by immersion? Each of you might ask, let me rephrase that. May I, may I, ask, may I ask you this question about what we've just studied? And please don't answer out loud. Just answer in your mind. This is between you and your God. If you're uncomfortable answering, just be honest with God and ask Him for help. He always helps when you ask Him for help. When I study the Bible with anyone, this is one of the most important questions that, that we, can, we can answer. Have you made this decision to follow Christ and accept Christ as your Savior from sin and be baptized for the remission of your sins? That's probably one of the most important questions you could ever be asked in your life. Or if you were to lose your life today, do you have the assurance that you would spend eternity with Jesus? I hope so. What if Jesus does come back tomorrow? Are you ready to meet him? We don't know the day and hour of his return. Or what if you died tonight? Are you ready to meet him in peace who died for you? We know for sure from prophecy that there's a storm coming. We're going to study more and more of it. I and a lot of others believe that this storm is closer than any of us even realize. Just this article I read you to this before we started today, that's another sign. <clears throat> so I want to encourage each of you to keep studying and learn as much as you can about the Bible and the prophecies of the last generation. But even more important than that, the Bible says there's a storm coming. And if you haven't made that commitment to Jesus to follow Him or to follow Him more closely than you ever have before, I want to encourage you to do that today. I want to encourage you to do that, make that commitment to God every day you wake up and He gives you breath. There's nothing to be afraid of by making a decision to follow God. Nothing. It's the person who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus that should be afraid. What do you have to lose? Jesus is our only salvation and the hope of this dying world and time is running out. I'd like to have a prayer with us before we, we leave. Heavenly Father, we've seen this evening that one of the most important decisions that we can make in our life is to accept Jesus as our personal Savior from sin. Oh Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit and convict each of us in our heart that we need to stop sinning. We need to stop re-inflicting wounds and pain on the Son of God. Father, we ask for the power in our lives to overcome all sin. And we ask for a hatred of sin in our lives. And Father, we ask that you would help each one of us to understand the importance of not procrastinating, but to make a decision today to follow Jesus. Because we don't know how long we have left on this earth. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stacy has some decision sheets that we'd like to pass out. I want to remind you our next meeting is on Saturday night at 7 p.m. We're going to be talking about prophecies, superpowers.
And we're not going to be able to cover the whole subject because there's a lot of superpowers. So we have to, I have to split it up a little bit. But we're going to cover a lot of information on Saturday night about other prophecies that the Bible talks about. Superpowers on the earth. When you get this decision sheet, sheet these are some really simple statements I wrote on here. The first one says, I understand that I'm a sinner and not and in need and need a savior from sin because I cannot save myself. I'm going to check that right now. <laughs> I need to do it. The second one says, I know that Jesus is the only way to gain salvation, power over sin, and personal peace in my life. If you know that or you believe that, put a check mark next to that. Number two box. Number three, probably the most important decision we could make. I accept by faith the sacrifice that Jesus made in my behalf on the cross of Calvary and desire him to save me from my sins and grant me eternal life through his amazing grace. Please, if you have any conviction of the Spirit of God in your heart, put a check by that box. And last, I desire to be baptized for the remission of my sins as Jesus has given us the example by complete immersion as a public expression of my love and gratitude for what he's done for me. Now obviously we can't respond immediately because we don't have a baptism tank filled up. But if you, if you desire to be baptized for the remission of your sins, like the example Jesus gave us, put a, put a box, a check in that box. Because one of the things was you have to learn, you have to understand the truth. And we'll continue studying. Next topic, you don't want to miss this one. Saturday night, 7 o'clock, Prophecy Superpowers. And with that, you may consider yourself dismissed.